<laughs> okay, Michelle, if you say so. <laughs> you know, it um, always I know. Yes, it does. Okay, so we're broadcasting and we're just going to wait a little bit. We don't have any attendees coming in yet. So hopefully there's some coming. Can you see well, the participant box, John? I see the, uh, at the bottom, I see four participants right now. So at least one person must have just joined we us. Have, we have someone joining us, so that's good. We're just giving it a few more seconds to let folks join us this morning. Uh, and that person is actually my intern. So um, oh. the new intern, uh, Michelle Kailia. Hi, Kailia. You can't talk back to us, but hi. <laughs> I've met her before. We, we met John one time, so. Good, and I think part of her plan is to do an informational interview with you to learn more of what you're doing and also to learn about the um, accountability reports and great, build, track, great. build track 50 and things like that. Well, my goodness, um, this might be a short meeting. I don't know. You think we should wait? We should, obviously we should wait. Maybe. Yeah. You know, it's Saturday morning. People are getting their coffee. My husband's still sleeping. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny when you talk to folks and, the, the topic of uh, sleeping in comes up. And I, I, I think there are still people that will sleep in till nine o'clock or something like that. And, oh man, you know yeah. it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, for me, sleeping in is 6.30 a.m., 7 a.m. I don't know, that's, that's sleeping you know, in. I'm an early riser. Oh, I get up early. I've always <laughs> gotten up early as a swimmer, but I can sleep in if I want to. Like, I can normally get up by 5.30, but if I have a day where I'm going to sleep in, I can sleep until 8, 8.30, maybe wow. 9. You guys wow. are making me look bad. No, 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 okay. bad. Just saying. <laughs> but my husband, he can, he can really sleep, too. You know, yeah. it's funny. He's a teacher, huh. so he's just now kind of got, I mean, here in the last month or so, gotten back to work, and he said to me, this was, I don't know, the day before school really started. I think I'm setting my alarm for the first time in six months. And I thought, don't say that to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and my, my husband just retired May the 1st. And previous to that, I got up with him every morning at 5.30 a.m. and sent him out the door by 6.06. 06. So, and then my day began personally. So I've been an early morning guy for years and years. I, I generally love it. But boy, I will take advantage of sleeping in any time mm -hmm. I can. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then in the in the winter time, it's so it, for me, it's harder to get up in the morning because it's darker and it, and it's typically colder. So uh, I like when the long days. We have the long days in the summertime, and you can leave the windows open and everything else. Although with all the smoke, it's been really hard. Mm. Yeah, it has been. It's been nice here the last few days, even though it's been so cold. I haven't been able to keep the windows open, but I'm thinking maybe tonight might uh, be warm enough to keep the windows open, right? But yeah. it was so smoky there for a while. I couldn't, I'd wake up with a sore throat and my head hurt. I just couldn't keep the windows open. Well, How are we looking for the fire? Well, you know, the, um, the snow and the precipitation has helped a lot. I think the terminology is the, the fire has been parked. Um, but, and, and, and basically, you know, one of the challenges has been that because of the wet nature of the snow, it's caused power lines and trees to topple and that's made it harder to access. I think they're still assessing, although we've gotten a bit of an update, which I don't think is totally public yet, but there, have been, there has been uh, property damage. We have a participant on the line now. Okay, but there, there has, I mean, I think it's a, it's a big plus with the snow and the rain. Um, I mean, they're still clocking it at 102,000 acres, 4% uh, containment, and they're anticipating that you know, minimal activity, they're smoldering, you know, they're, they're putting in containment lines, they're putting out some of the, you know, areas, but that ultimately, um, uh, you know, in the next few days, depending on how hot it gets and how dry it gets, they're, they're assuming it'll, you know, fire activity will resume. John, we do have some people coming, so okay. maybe Shall we be now is the time to get going. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Of course. Are we good? We are good, go ahead. So, Okie doke. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, September 12th community conversation for 
uh, folks living in Fort Collins and Laporte, of course, everyone is welcome. My, my name is John Kafala, Slaumer County Commissioner, uh, District 1, and this is part of our, you know, monthly efforts to stay connected with people and to, to be as transparent and accountable, accountable as we can be. Uh, today, I'm really happy and honored to be joined by our Lamar County Clerk and Recorder, Angela Myers, and she can, she'll be speaking very soon, giving an update on the, how we're preparing for the election. And of course, Michelle Bird, our, our uh, Public Affairs Director, uh, and she will give us an overview of the Zoom webinar protocols. It looks like we have a um, uh, small turnout today, and I hope that's okay with folks, but the, the plan of action is that uh, as soon as I get done talking and Michelle explains a few things, we'll turn it over to our clerk and recorder who will provide us with a very important and timely update about what's happening with the upcoming elections and then opportunity for folks to ask uh, questions. And then once she's done, I'm available to answer any other questions about other topics that folks are interested in. Um, with that said, Michelle, uh, would you tell us what we need to know about our wonderful social media platform here? Or, or Zoom? Sure, thank, you. thank you, Commissioner. Um, again, my name is Michelle Bird. Good morning to you all, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning. Um, if you haven't joined us in the past, you'll notice we are using a platform called Zoom Webinar, um, which is a little bit different than what you would normally see if you're used to attending a meeting in Zoom, maybe for work or with just your family. Um, the biggest difference you'll notice is there's no chat box for you to use. Um, and so instead we use the Q&A box and we use that for a couple different reasons. Um, both of them are related to safety. Um, with the Q&A box, I can see what you guys ask before we make it live. Um, this isn't to vet your questions or to change your questions. The purpose is so that if we had participants coming in, you know, of course we keep this open to everybody, Participants coming in, able to freely send chats back and forth to other participants. We worry that someone might send a link um, that has some type of ransomware or a virus. Um, if you clicked on the link, link, it would infect your computer, or it might take you to a website you don't want to go to. Um, and, and we want to keep you guys safe from those things. Additionally, you'll notice that you can only see the faces of the, what we call panelists on this, this format. Um, again, same kind of safety reasons. We invite everybody to attend and participate, but we don't always know what everyone's intentions are and we don't know what they might intend to put on their screens. Um, so that it's one of the ways we, can, we kind of protect everybody from that as well. Um, but of course you can still participate. Please use that Q&A function to ask questions. You can type in your questions or if you just have comments you'd like to make. Maybe you don't, you don't have a question, but you have a comment you wanna make. Just go ahead and put in that Q&A section and I'll, I'll make it live so everybody can see it. Our intent is not to um, hide your voice. We, we wanna make sure you're heard, your comments are heard, um, but we just wanna do it in a safe way for all of our participants. Um, if you wanna talk to us, um, you can have that option too. You just need to use the raise hand feature. You'll probably see it somewhere kind of at the bottom of your screen where you typically see your chat box. Um, just click on that raise hand feature um, and it'll let me know you want to talk and then I'll walk you through how, how to get that going. I don't see anybody called in right now, so I'm going to skip the call in instructions for the moment. Um, but if I do see someone called in, I'll, I'll jump in and add those in there at the time. Um, and that is how we participate. And Commissioner, I will hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And I will now hand it over to our esteemed Larimer County Clerk and Recorder, Angela Myers who is very kind and gracious to take up some of her time on a Saturday morning. Welcome, Angela. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Michelle, for all those details. Oh, they're so much <laughs> fun, aren't they? Um, and honestly, uh, Commissioner, I am always delighted to get the word out about election processes, so Saturday morning or not, middle of the, I don't wanna say middle of the night necessarily, but pretty much any time I'm available and happy to have conversation. So um, elections right around the corner. I mean, it is uh, with, <laughs> within reach almost. Um, and so I want to take every opportunity to talk with uh, the community, uh, any citizens who might have concern about the noise out in the world. Um, and so I want people to be reminded, if nothing else, that they have a direct link, and that direct link is me, to the realities of our elections here in Larimer County. 
and that noise doesn't affect necessarily how we operate and I want to just answer any questions or concerns that might come up. Um, and I'll go back to that in just a moment. The first thing I will say to everyone otherwise is that um, elections is getting pretty close here. Please, 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 if you are not registered, um, do so now. If, you're, if you are 17 or know someone who is uh, uh, 17 and going to be 18 by election day, please ask them to register now. Don't wait until election day. Um, that creates a lot of activity in our polling sites and we're gonna be busy anyway. And um, we've got COVID going on. So we really want to um, keep as many people from using our um, in-person uh, realities as much as possible and to instead take advantage of the wonderful system we have here in Larimer County in Colorado. So um, I cannot imagine that the first thing on folks' mind who are participating isn't uh, the noise out in the world and the questions associated with those things. So I'm going to jump right in with that, Michelle. I'm assuming you will like raise your hand and give me a heads up if there, somebody's got a question that they want answered. I enjoy a dialogue. So um, I don't want to just sit here and talk, but I will if uh, nobody else does. I'm happy to do that. So, but if I need to be interrupted with someone's com conversation, please do so. That's most important to me. Let's talk about the noise. So um, first thing I want to say is uh, elections are emotional events. I know that and that's uh, that is as it I, I don't know if it's as it should be, but it is as it is. I mean, it just is the reality um, in order to get people's attention. Uh, emotions have to be activated or, or the, the intent the people think they have to be activated. And so there's a lot of noisy emotional stuff going on out there. Please know inside my walls inside my operations that emotion doesn't exist. We leave it outside the doors and we're here to get a job done. And we have a very, um, uh, very detailed list of laws and regulations we must follow, rules we must follow. We do those without emotion. We simply are going through a checklist and getting things done. It's a very complex, a very complicated checklist. But, um, you know, there's a lot of noise out there. Nothing's changed in Larimer County for getting our elections done. And we've had successful mail ballot elections since 2013. I'm very proud to say so folks should be very comfortable about how our operations will work. Please don't do anything like, oh, decide you got to get your ballot way early because you're just concerned about mail ballot or whatever. Wait for your ballot to come to you in the mail. Um, don't decide you're going to do something interesting like test the system. You decide to test the system. We take that very seriously. You do that, you're going to get a visit from the DA, um, period. And your desire to test the system will not matter to them. RDA, I'm very grateful to say, is very um, serious about um, election fraud. That is called election fraud. The first ballot you uh, return to us will be the one that's counted. The second one would get you a visit from the DA. So make no mistake about it. There's a lot of noise about mail balloting. Why isn't the entire nation doing it? Um, I am here to tell you, we had a lot of opportunity to get used to the idea before we did it in Colorado. We were a permanent mail-in voting state before we became an all-mail ballot state. And permanent mail-in voting meant that folks could simply tell us one time, with no excuse, that they wanted to get their ballots in the mail. Folks did that in large numbers back then. And um, we had, before we went to all-mail balloting, we had more than 70% of our voters across the state, certainly in Larimer County, who already had decided to be mail-in voters. We had a lot of spooling up to becoming an all-mail ballot state to make that successful. That happened over a period of time. And, um, and since 2013, when we became an all-mail ballot state, which uh, uh, incidentally was an off-year election, make note, that was not a presidential year. It certainly wasn't a gubernatorial year either. It was one of our quieter elections when we began testing that, doing that. Um, and we have more modified our processes over the years. I mean, it is not, perfection didn't come right off the bat. Although we were successful, we certainly uh, have improved the system over time. Um, and those improvements are very important. I will tell you, if someone told me, and I've been at this for seven years, guys, I've been clerk for seven years, I've been in the office for 17, somebody told me a couple months ago or, or today that I had to be an all-mail ballot, run an all-mail ballot election, I'd be apoplectic, and I would lose 90% of my staff. So it's not something you do like that. There are too many details, and I, there's a lot of talk about fraud out there. I think the bigger risk to something like that is administrative failure. 
because there is very little chance of getting it all right if you don't have time to vet those processes before you even get started. And now you're in the throes of the whole thing and it's really difficult to get it right. And administrative failure um, creates windows for fraud. So that is the bigger concern. Um, we have an exceptional model here in Larimer County and Colorado. You as a voter should be extremely proud of that. You should feel extremely comfortable. This noise doesn't really apply to us here because we've got a great system, in, including the Postal Service. That's another piece of noise we're hearing about out there. Um, and I got to tell you, these postal workers, I got the utmost respect for them. The postal system operates extremely well. Consider the fact that they handle billions of pieces of mail every day. And their error rate is very small if you take that into consideration. Yes, uh, errors happen, period. I mean, it's true. They happen everywhere. Happen with your doctor, with your IT service and everything like that. So um, they do happen, but I assert to you they happen in a very small um, a number, especially here in Larimer County. Um, I have extreme confidence in our voting, our uh, U.S. postal system, um, and I'm on weekly phone calls with them. We, uh, and this is not new, we have for years been in direct contact with them before we do an election. We make sure that our ballot envelopes, both directions, are um, prepared in such a way that they are most successful for them to run through the system. And never do we begin election without collaboration directly with the Postal Service because we are an all-mail ballot state. All states don't have that collaborative relationship built yet. And that's perhaps where um, more concern would be realized. But here there shouldn't be those concerns. I am very confident that our operations will be as they've always been with respect to our mail balloting. And we have had assurances from the Postal Service that it's business as usual here in Colorado. Okay, can't speak for the nation, but I can certainly speak for Larimer County in Colorado. So let those worries um, and that noise you know, go in one ear and out the other. Uh, I think it's more uh, applicable to other states across the nation rather than Colorado because we do have such a great system. Take advantage of our wonderful system here in uh, Larimer County and Colorado with our mail balloting. We've had a lot of time to vet it. As I said, you should be comfortable with it. Don't, um, don't take it for granted and, and not pay attention to it. Uh, use it, especially this year with our unique realities. Um, don't go into a voter service polling center unless you absolutely have to. And even then, I ask that you call our office first, 970-498-7820. We will do everything we can to keep you from having to go into a voter service and polling center um, because of our unique realities. Um, I am very proud to say that um, we, my folks in the clerk and recorder office on all levels from vehicle licensing to recording to elections administration, we have never stopped serving the public at all. We've, we've uh, had face-to-face -face contact with public the entire time through COVID. I am very proud and blessed to say that we have not had a single case of COVID reported in my, among my staff. Um, and we, during the June election in which we had to employ a lot of um, uh, very interesting, uh, barriers and, and mask operations and things like that for our election operations and our election judges who generally are among the high risk population. Um, we've not had that I know of a single case of COVID, um, especially related to our activities. So I'm very blessed and grateful for that. So I think that's a testament to the operations we have in place and the things we're doing. I, uh, I would though encourage all folks to um, not come in unless you have to, because that's part of what keeps us as safe as we've been. I see there might be a question. Is there a question in there, Michelle? There's something in chat. I don't know what it is. No, Angela, I just, you you gave the phone number, so I listed the phone number and sent it in the chat. So folks, if they didn't have time to write it down really quickly, they were able to access it still. Okay, wonderful. Uh, yes. I have a couple, a couple of questions, Angela, and I, I'm sure you'll get to these, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about um, when, when mail and ballots will be, you know, we'll start sending them out. Um, what people can do if, for some reason, they don't receive it. Uh, also, the option of, you know, dropping off one's mail and ballot at the various ballot boxes that we currently have deployed, and additional ones that will be deployed. Could you speak a little bit to those specifics, please? Absolutely, John. Thank you very much. Um, ballots are going to go out. I always say the week of October the twelfth. However. 
you're hearing in the news and from other counties that they drop at the post office on October the 9th, and that is indeed the case. However, in Larimer County, for years, I have said it's the week of because I don't want to create a false hope. Give some thought to the fact that every single county in Colorado is receiving their ballots at the same time. We all drop at the same time. So I want to give our Larimer County citizens um, the best anticipation I can give them for when they will receive them. So they will receive, begin receiving the week of the 12th. Um, and uh, we, uh, I, I tell people, if you don't receive your ballot by the 21st, that gives a full two weeks. If you don't get your ballot by then, call us, 970-498-7820. She's got it on the chat. Um, and check with us about the status of that ballot, and we will get another one on its way to you. We are not able to mail anything to you um, eight days before election. You should never mail your ballot in within eight days of election day. Now this year, you might wanna give it a little, even a little more window, that call is yours to make, but, um, but we say eight days before the election, don't mail us anything and we won't be mailing you anything. We would, after that, it's too late for us to do so by statute. So, um, and that this year, I believe is the 26th of October. Um, so when you get your ballot, please, please, please vote it right away. Get it in the mail, turn it, go to that kitchen table, right, to make, your, make your choices right then um, and put it right back out in your mailbox. That is true convenience for you. You know, mail balloting is the great equalizer. Everybody gets mail, no matter your socioeconomic reality and no matter anything, um, any challenges you have in life, you're gonna get mail. So it is the great equalizer. Likewise, it is the great equalizer for returning that ballot. It's gonna take a single stamp I have uh, quoted incorrectly earlier in the year, um, in this season. Um, a couple months ago, I, meant, I mentioned it would take two stamps. Unfortunately, I was wrong. I assumed it would. It's not going to. And the reason my assumption was wrong because we used to have security sleeves in there. We no longer do. And because I knew it was going to be a long ballot, I kind of assumed it would take that much. And, and clearly, it's not going to. We've, missed, we've waited. So it's a single stamp. Um, put it back out on your box. And the postman's going to get it right back to us. Um, but if you procrastinate, which I do too sometimes, so I'm not blaming anybody, um, go to your Dropbox then. We got Dropboxes all across the county. And every bit of information I'm giving you right now is included in your instructions that will be in the envelope in your, um, in your ballot, with your ballot, okay? On the reverse side of this, it shows you all those locations for dropping those ballots off and when those locations are open because they open at different times, as you can see. Um, and that's uh, uh, in accordance with statute. Our 24-hour boxes, however, open immediately upon ballots being acted. So they, those ballot boxes are unlocked. As you see right now, if you tried to drop a ballot in there, you wouldn't be successful because they're locked. Um, but once ballots are in play, we unlock them. And that is your best second option for dropping off ballots. Um, those boxes are under camera. They're available to you 24 seven. If you're an insomniac, get right back out there and um, uh, in the middle of the night and drop it off if you want to. Um, it's under camera for your security. Never, ever, 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 please don't give your ballot to anyone else, um, no matter their intentions. Um, and uh, you, you know, no matter your challenges, you can put it right out back out on your mailbox. If you can't do that and somebody's offering to, to take your ballot, ask them to give you a ride to the ballot box. And the reason I say that is this, I'm not saying anybody's got bad intentions, I'm not. What I'm saying is those folks picking up your ballot, their life is happening too. And what happens to the importance of your ballot if the person who collected it from you pokes themselves in the eye, they get in a car accident, their kids, uh, just went to detention in school, or, um, or they just found out their spouse has cancer or something. Or, you know, maybe they're not as organized as you are. And what happens if that ballot drops between their seats? We've had these things happen. And so um, it's important that you don't give it to anybody else. The, the, um, the priority of your ballot in the hands of someone else is not the same as the priority of the ballot in your hands or in our hands. So take care not to put a middleman in there, do it yourself, get it to us. There's too many great ways to do that. Um, as well, um, you know, when we talk about ballot security, the security of that ballot is most at risk when it's in your hands. Never ever give your ballot to someone else when you're, before you voted it, before you sealed it, before you signed the exterior or after. Okay, you're the one who puts that ballot at risk when you do. Also, please don't 
please don't share a selfie of your voted ballot. When you do that, you create a loss of anonymity for more people than just yourself. Those, uh, your ballot is a really a sacred place for you to have secrecy. It's one of the few places in this life. Don't throw it away. When you do, you also put other folks in a position of an expectation is created for them to show their ballot. Don't do it. Um, it's so important that you don't do it. Um, and I think there was a question that jumped up there and I missed it. Tell me what yeah. it is. So um, I think you might be getting here to this. Uh, you seem to be on this track, but talking about how folks can track their ballot to ensure it's been received. I, th I think Absolutely. you're going in this direction. Absolutely. After you send your ballot in, go to, Lair uh, go to votelarimer.org. Got this wonderful logo right up here on my counter. Um, we we uh, uh, copyrighted that, that is, trademarked that. It is uh, back in 2013. We're really trying to get everyone to use that for any information regarding elections in Larimer County specifically. Never, uh, you know, that's the place you can go. Easy to remember, votelarimer.org. And when you go there, there's a nice little icon that says track your ballot. And that's a way to, to know if we received your ballot or if, um, if uh, your ballot has not yet been received. And if you have concern about what you find there, call us 970-498-7820 with any questions you might have. Angela, we have some more questions. Sure. How do election workers verify signatures? And what about if a person's signature has changed from whatever is in file? So let's say I did my signature when I'm 18 and now that I'm 38, my signature looks a little bit different. Great questions. You're not 38. I know that's not true. But anyway, I am. Uh, uh, go ahead, John. I, I was just trying to be funny. I'm suggesting that I'm 38, but I'll, <laughs> I'll put this back on mute. Carry uh, on, please. Well, I could be a comedian and say I am too, but okay. Um, uh, okay, so how do we check signatures? Signature verification on the exterior envelope, and I wish I'd have brought one to the to the Zoom meeting to me, with me this morning, but um, that is one of our security practices in Colorado. It is a very important part of what makes our mail balloting so um, successful and something that you as a voter can rely on. So you are required to sign the exterior of your envelope when, uh, when you send it to us. If you don't sign it, we're never going to open it. We're gonna uh, send you a letter. That letter is gonna say you have until eight days after election day to cure that ballot or your ballot envelope is never opened and your ballot is never counted. So um, first thing we do when we receive those ballots, we run them through an automated machine that's called an Agilis in our world. And there's about five counties across the state that have these machines. Um, it, it cures automatically in the same way it cures signatures in banking. Um, your signature on the exterior. It has, that's why you got a barcode under your signature uh, line there. It queues up, that barcode queues up for the system, uh, the, your signature in our voter registration system and statewide voter registration system. And so that machine compares those two signatures quickly, right like that. Um, it cures about 50% of signatures for us right off the bat. Then the ones it can't cure, it takes a picture of that signature on the exterior of the envelope. It's taken a picture of all of them, but the picture of the ones it can't cure go out to a bank of judges who see that signature on a screen. They're working always in a bipartisan team. Everything in Larimer County elections is done in a bipartisan team. No one ever works alone. These two folks are sitting at a computer and they see that signature from the envelope and they see that signature from the score system, uh, one above the other, and, um, and they compare. Interestingly enough, a quick comparison is the most accurate because you can talk yourself in or out of anything, right? And so, and you would be surprised the nuances of your signature that carry over. Yes, folk signatures do morph over time. There's no question about it. But we have every signature we've ever, every signature you've ever used with us is collected. And we have access to those. So if those folks off the top of it can't agree that that's your signature, then that uh, Agilis machine calls out the ones they can't agree on. Those ballots, envelopes now themselves, go to the second bank of bipartisan team judges who now have the envelope in their hand. They've got all those signatures for you in the system from any time you've worked with us since you were 18 to 38. Um, and they can look and see, has, is this that person indeed? And yes, it, and they can say yes or no. And if they say no, 
Now you're also going to get us an eight day letter. It's going to say you got until eight days after election day to cure that or your ballot is never going to be counted. Your ballot envelope is in fact not even going to be open. Um, as we're as we're doing our work in elections, we start, you know, a couple weeks before election day. And um, as we do that process, we're sending those letters out each day. So we don't wait until election day to send those out. However, lots of votes wait till election day to vote. And so when we get those on election day, then you only got eight days after that and we have to mail those. So we also will send you a notice on email if you've provided us your email address. Very few people do that though. We encourage you to do so. Um, and we will send you an email if we're able, if we've got that information for you. Um, so don't wait until election day to get your ballot to us. Angela, if I may, I, I'm the one who's been posting the questions, so I want to make sure if there are some of the participants, attendees, that if they have specific questions. But actually, a question that I've always had is is this regarding signatures, and I'm, I'd appreciate you answering it because I've always wondered. So when I first registered 100 years ago, before I was 38, um, I, my signature includes my middle name, John Michael Kafalas, and that's what I get back. And when I sign it, I include my middle name, but I rarely ever use my middle name, you know, when I sign a check or this or that. Can you speak to that, Angela? Should I, I need to either change my voter registration to just have my first and last name, or I need to be making sure that I include Michael when I'm, you know, signing on the, on the envelope there. Great middle name, by the way. Oh, Make thank you. <laughs> um, um, no, it doesn't matter. I get this question all the time. Um, it does not matter. Uh, we are looking at the nuances of your signature. And, um, and so uh, we will, it will cure either way. So don't worry about that. Folks ask that question all the time. What if you just signed with J? Kipalis, right? We still will do it. Um, the letter J, you know, not the name J, but um, you know, so yes, we we're looking at the nuances of that signature and you will still be successfully processed. Yeah. What other questions do I have, Michelle? Hey, John has some other questions, but that's okay. Um, they're questions that we hear all the time, Angela. So I think they're great questions. Absolutely. So John asks, what about voter registration? Has a voter registration increased? And what is the last day folks can register to vote? Um, and then after that, there's another question, but I'll let you address voter registration. First. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, yeah, absolutely. Voter registration is up. We get vote, voter registra registration is up before every election typically. Um, and this will be our biggest election. This will be the biggest election I've ever conducted. The presidential always is. And for that very reason, because we have more people, our, our area is growing. If we did not have an area that was growing, that would not be the case. But that just means that more people are engaged uh, because more people live here. Also, folks talk about turnout of elections. You know, turnout is uh, uh, precipitated by people having an interest in what's on the ballot more than any other factor. Um, it's their interest in voting on whatever the question or the candidate is. And so typically, always, presidential elections are highly um, uh, voted and um, have a lot more folks register and get involved and participate. So it will be our biggest election. When can you, when's the last day to register to vote? Colorado's the same day registration state. We did that beginning in 2013 when we went to all mail balloting. That was another uh, element of that legislation. And that's one of the main reasons why we still have voter service and polling centers or polling places for you to vote in person if you need to. Please don't, unless you have to, even though you hear a lot of noise in the world. Okay, please don't. In Colorado, in Larimer County, it's totally not necessary. That ballot you get in the mail is gonna work just fine, but that's why we need those because folks on election day, uh, their life is happening every other day. On election day, they hear a lot of noise and they're like, I didn't get it done, I gotta go do it. And they can, they can go in, register and vote the same day. Awesome, good. That's an next one. Um, the last one, or the last one from John, I, again, I, I um, Ask our attendees if they have other questions, please don't be afraid to ask them. That's what we're here for today. Absolutely. Um, why is it important to vote sooner rather than later and not wait till the last minute? Lots of reasons. Um, let's take the, let's pretend it's not a presidential election. I've been saying this for years, by the way. When I first was clerk, I had big dreams and I was gonna be the clerk. 
who could get election night results done. Man, we can do this. There's no reason for not doing this. What is wrong with us? I mean, I can do this. And I, uh, I had an aha moment one election early on when I sent my folks home at 6 a.m. We watched the sun rise. And when I did that, I prayed that my folks would get home safe. I had just worked these people more than 24 hours straight. Um, they are um, off, uh, many of them uh, older folks because those are the folks who often help us because they're retired, they've got time. Um, I, uh, you know, they have already put in many hours of very detailed work. It's not difficult work, but it's exacting work. It must be done exactly so. So you've got to pay attention and have that heightened attention to detail the entire time. And then I'm sending them home in the morning and it's November in the snow. So um, I vowed that night or that morning that I would never do that again. Um, and that who cares what Clerk Myers wants? I would love election night results. Who cares what I want? It's what the voter cares about. If you care about election night results, you'll vote early because we are an all mail ballot state. In years gone by, when you voted in a polling site, you put your ballot into a machine as you left. That machine actually counted that ballot. The counting was done. And all we did was pull a, pull a card out of that machine and download it into our system and we had your results. So we could do it much more quickly. Now with mail balloting, everything happens on the back end. And so we need folks, if they care about election night results, to vote early. Now, when I began saying that, I said to the press, I, you know, the other thing I didn't feel comfortable about as a clerk was this, this um, every election night I would get this phone call, Clerk Myers, what do you think? Are you going to keep going or are you going to stop? And I didn't like the way that felt because, you know, election results can change from the night before to the next day. And I never wanted anyone ever to think that, the that I stopped counting because I didn't like the results. And so um, I talked to my staff, what is our capacity on election day? And I said clearly to the press and to the public, um, if we get more than 20,000 ballots on election day, we will stop and continue voting the next day, period. Um, and so it, everybody knows the ground rules before we get started. Um, and it's not an arbitrary call I make on election night. And, um, and honestly, there have been very few times we've not gotten more than 20,000 ballots on election day. And that is the voter's choice. If you as a voter care about election night results, you'll vote early. Clearly, you don't care about it as much as I did, or you would be voting early. I mean, you know, it was important to me. But, and it is important. People's lives are hanging in the balance, right? So it is important. Um, and so here's how it's going to it's going to go. And, and, and let me back up just a minute. I got a little ahead of myself. You know, this now is a presidential election year. Our volume is going to be exponentially heavier. And we've got these interesting realities. Right. And so we are uh, we're going to be socially distancing. We're going to be cleaning. We're going to be doing things that slow down the process. If you're doing in person voting again, another and, and it's going to slow down the process for us to do our counting because our counting facilities are uh, are, have barriers and all these processes in place as well. So it's going to slow us down, making it even that much more important for you to vote early. The other thing it's going to do for you as a voter, um, you're going to get fewer calls. You're going to get fewer of those robocalls. You're going to get less mail because those folks who are doing the political outreach are checking with us regularly to see who has voted. They don't want to waste their money or their time on folks who've already gotten their ballot in. So get that noise out of your way early on and vote early if you can. Thanks, Angela. I actually, we have another question. Um, how do we accommodate voting needs of persons with disabilities? Um, those may be visually impaired or blind. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, in every single one of our in-person voting sites, our voter service and polling centers, we have electronic equipment that allows folks to listen to the ballot. They have a touch pad for voting, making their vote count, and they get to listen back to what the ballot is, um, what, how their vote is going to be counted. Um, we also have large print options for voters. If they want to request a large print ballot, we certainly can get one to them. They simply need to call us. 970-498-7820. We will get them a large print ballot. We have had requests in the past for Braille. Um, we make Braille available. However, we've never had anybody actually use the Braille, um, but we do make that available if it's needed. Um, and, um, you know, we are very in tune with the needs of all of our voters here in Larimer County. I'm very pleased to say that every single one of our voting sites has been vetted. Um, we have had the D Department of Justice come check us out 
in years past and I'm very pleased to say we had no issues of any kind to uh, relay. We take these things very, very seriously. I will tell you, I'm a stickler. I'm a stickler, guys, and it, it, it's annoying. It's annoying to some people. My staff are known as sticklers in this state. It's annoying. Uh, we have a reputation in this state as being real sticklers and I wear that as a badge of honor. Um, my staff does as well and um, we take these things very seriously. We are very detailed. Thank you, Angela. I don't have any other questions right now. You don't. Oh my goodness, I can fill the time. Ta John, can I have another couple minutes? Yes, of course, Angela. And, and I just wanna make sure that uh, the, 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 uh, the vast audience that's participating. Uh, first of all, much gratitude to Sharon, Beth, and, and Kylea. And once you're done, uh, again, if you want to exit, you're more than welcome to. I will do my best. I, when you send out the YouTube, I'll try to get it out through Facebook and other means, because I think what you've shared with us is really, really important, and, and folks need to know about it. But um, once you're done, if, if people are still might have questions for me, I'll be available, of course. Yes, please carry on. Very good, John, and I'll try not to take up all your time because obviously I never shut up, right? Uh, but uh, a couple things I want voters to remember. Top of your ballot has a stub. It's got an orange stub on the top. It says, I voted in the November 2020 general election. Keep that as a keepsake. Pull it off of your ballot. We need you to do that because we have to take it off as we process ballots. It's, it's on there for the purpose of check and balance for our printer as ballots are being uh, printed and, um, and put in the envelope. So it's an important... Thing for us to have there, but we need you to take it off before you send it in. Otherwise, our folks on the back end, it adds to our processes and takes us longer. Please remove it. Please wear it as a badge of honor. I always say, pin it on your lapel. Um, I know it's going to be a little strip, but isn't that even a bigger statement that you actually did vote? And use that instead of your I voted sticker. Those I voted stickers end up in your dryer and they ruin your clothes. And if you don't need an I voted sticker, um, if you don't need an I voted, I mean, if you got this thing instead of your I voted sticker, now you don't have to have that in-person contact that's required in order to get an I voted sticker. You know, some counties across the state put I voted stickers with their ballots in the envelope. Folks, it is ex exorbitantly expensive for us to do that. It's not good use of your taxpayer dollars. So we came up uniquely in Larimer County with this wonderful keepsake. I got a whole stash of them on my, on my um, lamp there from the votes that I've cast as clerk since we've had that, so keep that. Um, also, um, don't, please don't get your information from social media. Oh my goodness, that is not the place to get your accurate information. Um, we learned this last year, was it last year or the year before, um, that social media can cause real problems, especially in the heat of the moment as ballots are already out there. When folks get confused in those last moments, you can inadvertently create um, disenfranchisement because folks think something's happened and nothing has happened. I'm going to give you an example. We had um, an inference la uh, I'm not, it was either last year or the year before where um, a voter thought that they should have had a candidate on their ballot they didn't have. And so they posted a post that's been, and the reason they thought that is because they got a call from the candidates committee because those, those maps for who gets to, you know, those are complicated. And those committees, they're doing the best job they can, but they sometimes get somebody that's not in their real area to vote on them. And so that's what happened in this case. The person on the phone, I don't have you on my ballot, something's wrong with this process. And they put on Facebook that, um, that um, check your ballot because you may not have everybody on your ballot. And when I first heard it, First thing I did, skip a beat in my heart, right? And we checked to see, could we have been wrong? Could we have an issue? We did check. And so we wanna know that. If you have a concern like that, something comes up like that, call me directly. You see my, you go to votelammer.org, my picture's right up there in the corner. You click on that, you're gonna get contact information from me directly. My cell phone is on my desk phone. I wanna hear from you if you think there's an issue, okay? And in this case, we didn't have one, but by then it had already been perpetuated, right? And, um, and so that can cause people not to vote. In fact, one person went to the dark side. What's the clerk trying to do? Affect our vote. She's trying to keep people from, you know, keep a mess up the election. Um, and that makes people skeptical about the process in the system. And, um, and, and that's just unhealthy for anybody. I don't care what your political persuasion is. I will tell you the candidate in this case was very gracious. Um, I contacted them directly. They were completely on board with fixing it, fixed it immediately. But social media isn't like that. It's out there. The person who went to the dark side was contacted directly by the candidate because they would not take my calls. Um, they were contacted by the candidate. The candidate, uh, they 
finally said, uh, look here. And they said, oh, on the phone as I was related to me. So it's so important. And in the moment, people get in the heat of the moment. I said politics is emotional work and um, emotional for citizens. I get that. And sometimes that can create an emotional response. My, my neighborhood, uh, what's, that, what's that social media thing that's neighborhood? I see things on there. Folks next door. About, huh? Next door is what it's called. Yeah. Folks talk about collecting ballots for the folks in their neighborhood. Don't do that. Don't do that. You want to help folks get their ballot to us? Um, take them to that drop box. Um, don't take their ballot from them. Um, the, let me see. Um, folks always ask me about counting. Yes, we start counting early. Um, but results are never available to us even. We don't download what those results are until um, after 7 p.m. and all the both polls are closed. We know everybody's out of those polls on election night. So no, people say, well, how do they know how that election's going? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's not from getting actual information. It's because probably exit polls or something like that. And you know what? Exit polls are not always accurate, guys. People don't always tell the truth when they're put on, this, on, the, on the spot in person. So um, that's not where you're gonna get your best information. Vote Larimer.org on election night. Uh, we typically post 7.30, 9.30, 11.30. .30. And when we get more than 20,000 ballots on election night, we're gonna stop at that 11.30 window. That means my folks are gonna get out there about one o'clock. And, um, and we're gonna start again the next day, um, uh, you know, eight, nine o'clock in the morning and continue on. So that's the place to go for your information. I expect a very high turnout in the 90 percentile um, for this election, um, and that's wonderful. Uh, I love it when everyone votes, so please do. I don't care about your political persuasion. Participate in the process. It's so important. It affects every aspect of your life. It is the foundation of everything we do, and when everybody votes, we get the best results we can have. So um, uh, outcomes otherwise. So I appreciate um, that. Um, I think I have hit on everything I absolutely needed to hit on for you. And I so appreciate your time, John. I know I, I rambled on a bit, but I hope it was valuable to everyone. And don't forget, contact me personally. I take calls all the time about any concerns you got. Angela, thank you very much. And I'm not seeing any additional questions. So we'll move on to the next uh, uh, part of this uh, community conversation, and we'll post uh, what you had to share with us so it can get out to more folks. I, I wish you a good day, Angela Myers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, so uh, Sharon, Kylia, Beth, any questions about other matters of county government? Uh, Angela Myers, of course, is one of the, uh, I don't know how many elected officials we have, uh, you know, the 10. Uh, does that include the three county commissioners? So we have the three county commissioners and, of course, um, seven other elected officials. And while we oversee, the, the county commissioners oversee budgets and decide on budgets for the various um, uh, areas of county government, uh, ultimately they you know, they operate and, and we try to be supportive and work together. Hey, John, it looks like we have a question um, and it's about, it's not necessarily a county question, but it's about some legislation. So the question is, what are your thoughts on Proposition 118 workers paid time off? Well, I do have some thoughts. I haven't read the details of what the uh, Proposition 118 um, you know, the details of what it states. I know conceptually what it's trying to achieve. Uh, I know that there are a lot of um, workers who don't have the, uh, uh, the luxury of getting paid time off if there's a, a person sick in the family and everything else or other, for other reasons. Uh, but I think the nature of this, um, you know, this uh, community conversation is I, I don't really, uh, I mean, those, that's the extent of my thoughts at this point on Prop 118. There's a lot of information out there. I, I think nine to five Colorado is really uh, champion, championing this issue. Uh, I, I suspect there's um, opposition. And, I, and, and actually along those lines, I would say too that um, the Blue Book, I think people are familiar with the Blue Book. I know there's been some uh, noise about that in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the media recently. But I think ultimately that 
that blue book is going to be sent out very soon, the next couple of weeks. And the, uh, the intent there is to provide objective information about the, um, about the ballot measures and the pros and cons. So I really encourage folks to uh, uh, read that carefully. If, if whoever posed the question would like to speak with me offline, that would be a more appropriate setting. Thank you. I got out of that one pretty good, huh? Yeah, good job. <laughs> no other questions right now. So this is probably the best time to touch on the stuff that you maybe didn't get to touch on earlier, if there's anything. Well, I, yeah, thank you, Michelle. And, and I, again, I appreciate folks participating. It, it is a little surprising that our turnout this morning is, is quite low compared to you know, what, we're, what we're accustomed to, but, and that's okay. Uh, the only things I'd like to share with you at this time uh, is that I think, and Michelle can give more details, but in the next couple of weeks, if it's not already, our biannual community survey uh, will go live and there'll be various ways for folks to respond to that. And I'll ask Michelle to provide a few more details. Also um, kind of parallel with that effort to get input from the, from the communities, from the public, we're also going to, it's actually it's gone, it went live yesterday. We have a new um, a tool, uh, it's called Budget Balancing Act. And it's, um, if you go to larimer.org, uh, backslash budget, and then I think balancing act or something. Uh, but this tool is something that um, we have now put live. Thank you. Build your own budget. And it's an opportunity for folks to look at um, revenue expenses that, you know, how the money is being spent county, uh, county tax dollars and offer some input uh, in a very graphic way of uh, if, you, if you agree with the priorities that are currently in place, or if you would shift some of those priorities with the understanding that just like the state budget, the county budget has to be balanced. So that's a new tool, and we're hoping that that can help inform the commissioners uh, as we deliberate on the uh, 2021 budget. We're currently operating under the uh, 2020 budget, and we're trying to make this process uh, a little bit more user-friendly, a little bit more interactive. When we have our budget hearings in, in November, uh, we typically don't get a very big turnout. And, and so we're trying to find ways to get people more engaged to help inform us you know, when we make decisions about the budget and how to spend the people's money. So be aware of that, please. And it, thanks to Michelle for posting the link for the um, Budget Balancing Act. And Michelle, do you want to say a little bit more about the community survey? and how do you access that and when does it actually go live? I didn't see it um, this morning. Yeah, um, thank you. Our, we are going to have our community survey go live here in the next few weeks. Unfortunately, with the fires, we got behind a little bit on the schedule, but I think we're looking at the week of September. Bear with me just one second. I'm not sure what day it is today. So probably the weeks, sometime the week of September 20th, 21st is one we're gonna go live. Um, I did just now include a link as well in the chat box that is where the community survey will be posted. Um, there'll also be options for folks if they don't wanna take it online, which is totally okay. We'll also have an option where you can call me up and I can mail you one. Um, or there's actually an option to just take it over the phone as well. I don't have those details quite yet. We're not quite that far along. Um, but those will be options as well, and I'm happy to answer your questions um, about how you can do that. The survey will also be available in Spanish, um, so the link to the Spanish language version will be available on, on this site as well. Um, and as Commissioner, oh, go ahead, Commissioner. No, please finish what you were going to say. Michelle. I was just going to say this, this is a survey, just a little background. We do this survey every two years. Um, it's primarily a satisfaction survey. So we, we really ask residents how satisfied they are with the services that Larimer County provides to them. But we also have some other um, interesting questions in the survey about perceptions of our community, um, where you think we should be prioritizing um, our efforts here in the next years. Um, so I, I encourage you all to, to participate. 
Um, and my goal is to have a higher turnout than last year, or I'm sorry, two years ago. Um, I think we were somewhere in the fourth, now I'm really questioning myself. I'm gonna look it up. Um, I thought we had about 4,000, but now I think I'm really underestimating myself. But my goal is to be higher um, and to have a broader range of demographics respond. Um, we tend to get, you know, typically, and this is true of every survey you ever see across the country, um, women respond to surveys more than men, particularly older, more educated, higher earning white women tend to respond to surveys more than anybody else. And the same was true here in Limerick County. But our goals are to have a little bit of a broader outreach than we got last time. The survey is open to everyone. We're not just gonna call certain people um, and, and try to meet those demographic needs that way. We, we keep it open to everybody who wants to participate, but we're gonna put some more effort into some outreach for those, those demographics that maybe don't typically respond or haven't responded in the past. Uh, thank, thank you, Michelle. And there is a question from Kailia uh, that's connected to the survey. Perhaps you could respond to that. And then I believe Sharon had a question about the, um, the Gallagher Amendment uh, ballot measure that will, I think I could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually we hire what we do. We don't actually um, run the survey ourselves. We hire a, a contractor, a consultant that runs the survey. And yes, they have those auditory options for individuals with disabilities to participate that way as well. Yep, they, they have all of those options available for all of our residents. And then, Commissioner, did you want to answer the question about the budget? Well, I, so the question from Sharon is, uh, speaking of the budget, what are your concerns about the Gallagher question on the ballot? Um, so the ballot that we will start to receive in the mail uh, the week of October 12th, uh, in addition to voting for uh, president and everything else down the line, you know, folks running for public office, there will be, um, I believe it's 11, 11 statewide uh, ballot measures. Uh, some of them will be listed uh, as propositions like 118, which means that they would be uh, statutory changes to um, changing state law. Some of them will be listed as amendments. Um, the Gallagher Amendment, I think is amendment, I can't remember now, but it be, be, it's listed as an amendment because it would, if it passes, and it's essentially repealing something called the Gallagher Amendment, but if it passes, it would make a change to the Colorado Constitution. This particular ballot measure was referred to the voters uh, by the legislature in order to refer something to the voters that will be potentially a constitutional change. It has to have a two thirds majority in both the House and the Senate down in Denver, and indeed this did have bipartisan support. Um, in a nutshell, it would, the Gallagher Amendment was established, I think, back in the, uh, in the 80s, um, and the intent was to uh, keep residential property taxes low, people's uh, property taxes on their homes, and by and large, it's, it's achieved that. It said that in terms of the, the total amount of uh, property taxes collected, throughout the state, 64 counties, uh, no more than 45% of that uh, can come from residential property taxes. So there's this 55-45 um, ratio. And over the years, um, uh, residential property has generally increased in value at a much higher rate than non-residential uh, property like commercial, like vacant land, et cetera. And what that has, uh, um, cause to happen is an adjustment in what's called the residential assessment rate. When you get your property tax bill, it'll show you, you know, how the, um, the taxes are calculated. And there is this thing called the residential assessment rate. And currently the resident, so you have an appraised value of your home. Let's say it's worth $400,000. Uh, then you, um, uh, you multiply that by the, um, uh, the residential assessment rate, and in the, right now it's 7.15%, uh, or is, it, is that right? Yeah, 7.15%. And then that, that comes up with um, 
your assessed value, and then that's multiplied by mill levies and that sort of thing. And that determines uh, how much property taxes you pay. Um, the Gallagher Amendment um, in next year, uh, because of the projected appreciation of, of uh, residential properties, uh, unless it's changed, unless this thing passes, the implications for the county are that next year when we do the uh, reassessment, the reappraisal of, of people's properties, that's done every two years, we will likely have to use a residential assessment rate of 5.88% rather than 7.15%. And, and what that means, and also given that um, uh, you know, commercial property and, and other kinds of uh, property will, will uh, not appreciate as much, it means that um, uh, in 2022, the implications for the county are that we could take a 14 million plus hit on the county budget. Uh, most of our uh, revenue general, well, our general fund revenue comes from property taxes. Our sales tax revenue, 0.8 tenths percent, is what we call dedicated, uh, for dedicated purposes, like open space, like the behavioral health, like the operation of the ranch, um, and, and some ca and capital improvements, like the operation of the jail. So that's, that's what, Sharon, that's, that's a long-winded answer. But um, again, the blue book, and that's where some of the controversy uh, recently has occurred. Uh, there was um, some kind of a lawsuit uh, put forth to suggest that the changes in the language in the book, blue book uh, were, um, uh, one group did not support those changes, suggesting it's not giving the full implications of the impacts on property taxes. So you have people who want to repeal the Gallagher Amendment uh, because it's a fiscal, it has fiscal implications in the Colorado Constitution, and then you want you have groups that want to keep it, uh, and and um, uh, there clearly are benefits to um, uh, homeowners in terms of their property tax bills, but it does have a disproportionate impact on businesses in terms of their real property taxes that they pay on their on their buildings and their and their stores. And then, of course, they also generally have to pay personal property taxes. So that's the; those are the implications. If um, if this thing passes in November, then it means that the um, the the residential assessment rate will likely stay at that 7.15 percent. Because I think they also passed a bill in the legislature said you, to freeze it for a couple of years, but it would allow for more flexibility regarding you know, how property taxes are collected. If this thing doesn't pass, um, and I would submit to you that it's probably gonna be a heavy lift, uh, I, I don't know exactly the campaigns for and against how extensive they are, but if it does not pass, if it fails, uh, and it's a constitutional change, so I think it requires at least 55% of um, voter approval, if um, I, I believe that's correct, if it does not pass, then it means that the residential assessment rate will have to be reduced next year, and then that will impact the um, by at least $14 million or so in 2022, the money that the county has to provide services. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Very thorough answer, Commissioner, um, for a very complicated problem, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, and I would um, encourage folks, I. I know that the, um, you know, in Larimer County, the, the Larimer County League of Women Voters, they're, uh, they're starting up with their um, uh, candidate. Well, I know they've got some scheduled candidate forums, and I would presume that they're creating their little booklet that attempts to provide in, in more in simpler language, you know, the ballot measures um, and, and statewide ballot measures and uh, um, uh, you know, any, any local ballot measures. One last thing I'll say, so, so I, I'd, I'd ask folks to look for that in addition to the blue book, but I do know in the, um, a couple of months ago, or back in August, I guess that was a couple of months ago, um, there was discussion amongst the commissioners about whether we would refer a county uh, ballot measure that would allow us to, um, uh, quote, float the mill levy. In other words, uh, give the, um, the, the, the county the ability 
to uh, adjust the, the mill levy if indeed um, the Gallagher Amendment is still in place and if indeed the residential assessment rate would be dropped to 5.88%. We decided not to do that for a variety of reasons. And I think uh, even though uh, the county will, you know, will have to really tighten our belts even more, um, I think that was the right decision. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of noise out there these days and there's a lot of stuff on the ballot. And, and we wanna make sure that um, we don't wanna complicate things with one, you know, with one, one additional thing. Sharon did say thank you for the detailed answer, Commissioner. So well, much appreciated. And and I appreciate you participating, Sharon. And um, you know, Sharon is one of the members of our uh, Aging Advisory Council Office on Aging, and is, uh, has has been a strong participant over the years. And I think Beth is, if she's still on, that she's my wife. So I, that's awfully nice of her to <laughs> support our efforts. And then of course, Kylia. I it looks like. Um, it's now 9.36. We actually um, went pretty well. I, I hope, I don't know if there are any other questions, but if not, we'll, um, we'll end the meeting early and we'll, um, we'll look at next month and see what makes sense. Uh, I think we do have one scheduled for the Wellington, Wellington Waverly Buckeye communities, October 1, and we'll probably bring Angela back for that, but I will respectfully ask her to be briefer because we, uh, we'll have um, folks from the Solid Waste Department uh, giving an update on our efforts around um, the new landfill north of Wellington and then issues related to the uh, transfer station and the composting facility and the closure of the current landfill in the next couple of years. So that's the Wellington meeting, but um, you know, watch for all of that. And uh, thank you to Michelle, who is such a, again, a very uh, and competent and, and wonderful person to help with these things. And, and thanks to the folks who participated and we'll continue to try to get the word out. Yep. And yep. I hope everyone enjoys their weekend. Oh yes, that's right. Enjoy the weekend. Good yes. idea. Good idea, Michelle. Take care, <laughs> Take care everyone. Bye-bye.